to learn more about the MSA G1 SCBA. Bobby Halton, and I'm here with my good friend and partner, Eric Roden, who's the editor-in-chief of Fire Rescue Magazine. And we're on scene today at the Illinois Fire Institute, where together with UL and NIOSH, over the last two weeks, roughly, they, they've been conducting a series of experiments and uh, tests, uh, trying to gauge the level of exposure that firefighters have during firefighting to not only the carcinogens and the soot, and the particular matter, but also to the thermal insult that firefighters Correct. take through a very various um, measurements and uh, 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 measures that they've come up with, including blood gases, um, derma wipes. And we're going to go through some of that this morning with you, and then we're going to watch the actual uh, experiment, and we're going to really have a chance to get up close and personal. But before we begin, we want to give a huge shout out to our friends at MSA. Without our friends at MSA, we couldn't be bringing this to you today. So on behalf of everybody at Fire Engineering, Fire Rescue, Fire Press Emergency Equipment, Firefighter Nation, the whole Penwell Fire Group, we want to thank MSA from the bottom of our hearts. You know, don't breathe smoke. Get your MSA. Get your MSA on. Avoid, avoid smoke no matter what you do. The one thing we do know is that smoke is a killer. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to figure that out. And now we're going to learn through this series of experiments just how deadly and just how pervasive some of those toxins are. Um, MSA is an incredible company. Everything you need equipment-wise, whether it's a thermal imager, whether it's helmets, whether it's uh, 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 air monitoring equipment, and of course, world-class, state-of-the-art air packs. So on behalf of everybody here at Fire Engineering, remember, don't breathe smoke, get your MSA. So. Thank you, MSA, and we'll be talking a lot about them. Hopefully a few folks from MSA will join us sometime today, and we'll take a look at some of the incredible equipment that they're providing to this experiment. So without further ado, let's take a little bit of a look around the room this morning. And, and Eric, we'll, we'll kind of talk about what we're looking at here. If you're looking over my shoulder now, you see where the good folks from UL are sitting here at their laboratory table. They're logging in everybody, and we are in kind of the... Uh, doctor's room, if you will, where the, all the participants come before they do any of the on-scene testing. So we're just going to walk a little bit down here, if our camera person can join us. Yeah. And Eric, sure. let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing and, and what the what the what are the guys at the first station here doing in, in there. They're divided up by crews, right? Correct. Well, what you're seeing here with this flurry of activity is essentially the research lab component of our uh, makeshift fire ground, if you will. And what we're doing is we have as you can see on the wall, we have each individual numbered, and that, that number correlates to a specific function they'll be doing on the fire ground, whether they're the incident commander, the pump operator on the engine company, the first attack engine, the first do truck company that's going to do outside and interior ventilation, overhaul, et cetera. Each one has a specific job function. It's very important that we, we break them down individually so each sample we get from them, again, is correlated to their function and their position and area on the fire ground. Uh, rather than just dump 10 people into a room uh, you know, w without any function, we want to know which individuals have, or the, I guess, the, the greatest propensity to be exposed to these, these particulates, the products of combustion, the carcinogens, a lot of the stuff that we're measuring and, and, and getting metrics from. So what we do, again, we line them up here in the morning and essentially you know, we strip our shirts off, we get 12 leads placed on us, we start measuring and acquiring a lot of, uh, you know, blood samples, our exhaled breath with a sorbid tube, which we'll show you uh, momentarily. Alex, can you get a shot of this TV monitor here for a second? Eric, this is kind of interesting. You can see this TV monitor here. This is an actual shot of what it looks like inside the building. We're going to show you the building from the outside in a minute. But if you look at this, you can see it's a bedroom fire that they're going to be going to. And you can kind of get an idea, this is where UL is actually monitoring a lot of the different temperature levels and things of that nature. When we go outside, we'll look at where NIOSH is set up, and they're going to be actually sampling the particulates and the gases. So it's, kind of, it's, it's a pretty cool setup, but, but inside this part, there's something going on in almost mm -hmm. every nook and cranny of these oh, buildings. Yes. And, and this is kind of interesting, too, over here, Alex, if you get a chance to follow me. And 
For those of you out there in TV land, when I say Alex, that's our wonderful camera person. She's behind the scenes. But you can see right here the, uh, the uh, woman who's kind of talking like a, co a coach. That's, De that's Denise Smith. And Denise Smith is from Skidmore College. And Denise has been kind of the driving force, along with Galvin Horn from IFSI, uh, on this whole project. And you can see uh, another a member of the Skidmore College, uh, one, of, one of the deans, actually, who's kneeling down, doing some sampling with one of the firefighters. The firefighter that you see just off to Denise's side, leaning in, he's going to be the firefighter we're going to follow for, for most of the morning. His name is Matt, and he's going to be on the nozzle. Great guy, and uh, so Matt's going to be our, our kind of our guinea pig, or our subject today, if you will. Yeah, what Dr. Smith is also discussing is the decon procedure. Uh, obviously, there's some concern about transporting our gear back to quarters, and so we're simulating the interior of a fire apparatus cab in the room, just off to our, our left here. We're also doing wet and dry decon to kind of see what is the most effective and what is going to allow us to remove the most chemicals prior to putting ourselves back in service. Well, if you want to come over here, we can kind of look at, at one of the stations here. And what you see here is essentially a makeshift lab. We have blood draws here. We have thermal patches to, to med that we'll place on the neck and on, the, on your side. So you can determine outside skin temperature. Uh, as well as uh, having the individual swallow a, a thermal pill the night before, which will measure core temperature uh, as well as some of the other vital signs from our uh, from our insides. So, as you can see, it's Clean nothing that you wouldn't see at a normal clinic or whatnot, but it's all being done out here in our makeshift research lab. So, very very inclusive blood work, very inclusive uh, exhaled air. So, we're definitely acquiring a lot of a lot of samples that are going to give us a I guess a very good. Um, uh, measure of what we're actually inhaling and absorbing. Uh, obviously, it's very it's commonsensical that we're exposed to a lot of bad stuff and smoke. But now we're kind of looking at what are we uh, sorry absorbing more? What are we uh, what are we accumulating in our systems during basic firefighting? So under live uh, fire conditions. Some of the folks you're going to be seeing here this morning, you're seeing white lab coats. That's the actual folks from NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And those good folks are the same people that went to the Ebola crisis, uh, all the major events that have happened around the world, and, and they're here today, working and gathering the gases. Truly one of the most involved scientific experiments ever done on toxicity, carcinogens, and thermal insult for firefighting. So really, really incredible research. Amazing that we're able to get inside of it the way we are today. So. What you're seeing is history in the middle, which is Absolutely. pretty neat. Remember, you can send us questions if you have a question or you want us to ask a question. Send it to FE Talk. Send it to FE Talk. And again, while, while after, during our break at uh, 10 o'clock, please go to MSA.com and take a great look at all the great products that MSA has. And again, to our friends at MSA, thank you so much for supporting this endeavor. All right, let's go take a look at that gear. Each individual's gear is place in a particular order based on our function. So when we decon and we doff our gear, we know where it is, it's going to the right person, it's matched up correctly because we are taking samples off the firefighting gear as well. So what you see here is we have researchers from NIOSH again, getting the gear ready. Safety brief. Getting ready for the safety nope. brief. Outside real quick here. Yeah, we'll come back and we'll, we'll, real quick, what done is they've briefed cab of a truck basically the same space and in, mm -hmm. in these rooms here we don't want to miss the safety brief but this is where the gear goes when they come off and it's built and it's sized pretty much just like the cab of a truck so let's head outside and see if we can't catch the safety brief so what is this gonna do for us what's the Eric you're gonna have to mic up uh, Doug here so what is this what's this gonna do for us Doug what's this machine do and um, well, there's several machines on here, um, but essentially it's uh, it's just a platform uh, that we can we can use to sample from within the structure while the fire is going on, but also um, during knockdown and overhaul. Okay. And um, we're, we're focusing really on just on the particulate within, in this particular instance, and we because of the concentration so very high uh, during the fire and actually into overhaul, we need to dilute. Um, so we dilute the sample um, just ahead of the the instruments. But as somebody who's involved in aerosol environmental issues, 
you, you probably know better than anybody. So all smoke has a certain amount of particulate. Absolutely. And yes. we should avoid breathing it at all costs. Absolutely. And SCBA does a wonderful job at, at protecting the, the firefighters when it's worn, of course. When it's worn. Yeah. When it's worn. Uh, in, in your experience with firefighting and sampling, particulate matter in smoke, how far out does it go or how far can smoke carry particulates? Because even wildland, there's particulates even in wildland smoke. Absolutely, right? yeah. Well, obviously, um, um, today you'll, it'll be very visible, the smoke. Um, but even after, even after we've, um, the, the crews are, are done with um, uh, knockdown yeah. and they transition into overhaul, there's still particulate that's present. The heavy black stuff will tend to have moved out, but there's still very fine particulate that may be present. And that's part of the reason we're monitoring today is to try and characterize that. Outstanding. Well, thank you for what you do, and thank you for being out here. And well, we've got Steve Kerber here with us, and we're going to take a quick walk inside. Thank you, Steve. So we're here with Steve Kerber, the director of the Firefighter Safety Research Institute, the Underwriters Laboratory. And uh, Steve's going to give us kind of a real quick tour of the interior of our fire building, our test building today. So, Steve, what are we actually, or what is our setup here right. today? So we got a got tons of cable parts. bedroom, one bathroom, ranch house. We've got our two fire bedrooms down here. We're standing in the entryway that splits our dining room and our living room. We've got a behind us. And uh, for the most part, this is just searchable space. Because exposure and how much soot gets on the crews is so important, we need to make sure that all this furniture is clean in between tests. We don't want one crew rubbing up against furniture that has soot from the previous six tests. So instead of doing new furniture in here, even the fire doesn't make it in here, so instead of doing new furniture, uh, we clean it this way. So we're making temperature measurements every foot, uh, so that allows us to see the, essentially measure the fire, understand the environment. We've got four in this room specifically, because uh, as that attack crew opens that flow path, we want to understand what's happening specifically to temperatures either increasing there and not here, or increasing there and not here. We've got pressure sensors floor to ceiling in the corner over there. So those six tubes popping through in the corner, uh, those are all pressure sensors. So we've got this on both sides. So as the fire comes down the hallway, it's picking up how much energy would be hitting the fire crews. This is picking up how much energy would expose a victim remote from the fire. And here we've got our 145 pound rescue Randy. And instead of making measurements everywhere and saying this is what the victim could be exposed to, We've got a GoPro recording right here so that you'll be able to see what the victim would see. You've got a wireless temperature sensor, so how, what temperature would the victim be breathing. Wow. And then you've got a six gas meter right here, so we're understanding how much CO, CO2, O2, hydrogen cyanide that that victim would be exposed to. Wow. We'll have one victim here, and then there's a second victim in a closed bedroom over by the fire rooms that uh, both will have to be rescued by the search crew. Did, and did with the you, same instrumentation on both. Same people. exact instrumentation on both. Now, did you pick these locations and distances to, based on any data from NIOSH reports? or? No, uh, it's actually from previous experiments. We wanted a victim as remote as possible Within attached the to the fire room okay. uh, so that they are directly exposed. And then we wanted a victim as close to the fire as possible behind a closed door. Like we've done in all the others. So they have a chance at survival. If this victim was in that hallway, no chance. But there could be a chance if the victim's over here. We're seeing dramatic differences between, yes, you might be 50 feet from the fire rooms, but the layer in this room comes down real quick, and you actually watch it on the video. As that thick smoke comes down over top, we peg the meters uh, immediately. I mean, you go from zero CO to 10,000 parts per million CO pretty quick. So we've got cameras and uh, thermal imaging cameras everywhere. So here you can see our, our video view down here, the thermal imaging uh, detect, and that gives us the ability to essentially watch the, the search crew and the attack crew come through the door. We see what they would see as they start making their way to the fire rooms. And it also helps to document that flow path. Because that cool air gravity current is going to come rushing in as they take this door. Absolutely. And, and Stephen can actually watch that path go right to the and fire. And we pick it up right over here. So uh, we've got a camera cut into the wall right down here at the bottom. So we're watching the fire gases come out of the fire rooms. 
and then we're watching that cool oh, so air come in. This one here? So these are heat flux gauges. That shows us okay. how much energy is hitting that surface. Here's our thermal imaging camera right there in the wall. Outstanding. So we see that cool air coming in, heat flux here, the high coming the hot up. Gases hot gases start banking here. down, absolutely. And there's, your, uh, there's your bi-directional path. And we catch as they come in and they open up their hose line for the interior attack, what they do to this environment with their line immediately. So as far as lighting the fire, we light it remotely with what we call an electric match. Okay. So we take a power cord and we take it to a very thin wire that gets put through the matchbook here. We send power to that wire, it heats up the cord, lights the matches, which lights the chair on fire. Chair goes to the bed, flash the room over. Very similar to someone who's been smoking and in bed and then toss their cigarette down. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's candle. In, in this, these experiments, it's not so important how the fire starts, right. just that we have two rooms of fire for the crews as, right. and we want 12 identical experiments. So our job has been do what you need to do, give me 12 two-room fires that are as close as possible so the exposure and the cardiac and the stress and everything is consistent as possible as the crews begin to work on the fire. Well, as we go through this, you set up a series of experiments and you expect, expect certain things to happen. And what's new for us is you add that human element and there's been any number of things that have happened since we started this where it's what was their thought process? Why did they do what they do? That was really good. Why did they do that? And, and the ability to trace all of that back to training or, or experience, experience and any of those things is extremely important. But until we, I mean, we need to layer that human element on. And doing that in research is not easy. Uh, right. There's a number of IRB reviews that this study has to go through and a number of controls that we need to IRB, use. IRB, explain that for the class. Uh, it's, it's the process, the review process, that if you are going to use humans as part of your research experiment, that they need to be, I mean, as they're giving blood, urine, as you're monitoring their EKG, all of that is very sensitive information. And, and that's you want what to we make saw. sure they're being treated properly. And that's what we saw this morning. Absolutely. And, and that process is duplicated exactly every time absolutely for each individual and, and you really see the important. controls that we have here so from a fire standpoint there's a deluge system that we have charged and ready to so as we do our experiments i'm looking at all of the the video feeds i'm looking at all the temperature feeds and if i don't like what i see and the crew's not making the process i want water comes on here and we've got an attack line waiting to put water on the fire immediately and i think that's another important takeaway for for the audience the fire rescue firefighter nation fire engineering audience Listen to what a man who's done literally thousands of fires is saying. When he's doing live fire experiments with cameras, with thermal couplings, with some of the most disciplined crews, most choreographed live fire ever, he's got a deluge system ready because he knows better than anybody that it's, it, the, it, it's, it's not what you know that's going to get you, it's what you don't know. And any one of these participants could have a, a, a medical emergency suddenly. Uh, some change in the conditions could the cause pumps, the fire, the pumps, the uh, 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 something could happen. Yeah. And, and so he's ready. If, if Steve Kerber is using a deluge system in live fire training, that should be a lesson to everybody. And, and I know our standard 1403 doesn't currently have that in there, but I've seen other people do it at their live fires. And I think that it's a takeaway that, that, that is, is critical for people to hear. The reason you're here is for research, and there's two huge components to that. You're not just research participants, you're research partners, so please stay focused today. You must do your firefighting assignments as directed, and you must be attentive as you come back to that bay. You're going to be assigned by apparatus. You'll be deployed as an engine or a truck. You will come back to as interior, exterior, or overhaul. You've got to be mindful of both of those things, okay? When you're released from your fire ground responsibilities, I want you to get eyes on me and come right back into the front of the bay, All right? And then we'll do a lot of debriefing later. You'll stay attentive through the entire research data collection. They're replicating this 12 times, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. What you're going to be seeing in the next few minutes is the actual deployment. And one of the things that Dr. Smith said to them very explicitly, I want you to react as if this was a real fire. So we're going to do everything we can to stay out of the way. We'll probably be quiet so we don't 
disturb anybody, so it'll be a little bit quiet. But what you're going to be watching is the actual live fire experiment. You're going to be seeing exactly how it goes down, and we're probably about three minutes away from that. amazing stuff here. I'll tell you what, you see your crews getting their gear on. This is uh, just like you'd see in the real world. Everybody's checking their air packs. Checking First two truck companies arrived on scene. They're going to conduct forcible entry for the engine. Once they pop that door, the engine will make their, their interior push. our forcible entry. Good simulation. Okay, so now what you want to look at here is, here's your flow paths beginning. So as you can see, the cool air is coming in low. That's your cool air gravity current. Firefighters are getting down in there, staying just below that neutral plane. You can see that smoke coming in over their heads. That's the, uh, that's the other side of that flow path. So the wind is blowing into the door. You can see the line getting advanced and uh, hanging up a little bit on the door there. The door's kind of partially closed. So they're making that hallway that you saw. They're hitting the first room. You can see some of the stream coming out the window there. Got the drone overhead. You can hear him, see him hitting the second room. You're seeing some knockdown. You can see the flow path still. Be interesting to see how fast the conditions changed in that front room. And of course, squirting the chief with the hose line always scores your points with the guys. Getting the camera person's double points, but now look at the difference in the color of that smoke. That's a, there's your, there's your smoke indicator. Now we've got kind of a yellowish white smoke, if you will. But the smoke coming out the front door, still heavily charged, still very dark. Got a roof crew going up, taking the roof ladder. Mannequin coming out, so we'll get the readings off the mannequin. We're actually going to take readings off the mannequins as well, so we start to learn how much of the carcinogens and contaminants are actually being uh, absorbed in our props. I mean, the props that we use over and over again, which is important. I mean, and like Steve said, I mean, they were pinging out the meter at 10,000 parts per million of CO, far from the fire room, so they're definitely getting a lot of data on victim survivability.
So the interior crews are still working. We see the crews up on the right, roof. Right, There's one more victim they'll be removing shortly. Doing their thing. We'll start it's... conducting the secondary searches. I went down to an overhaul of the fire area. And behind us, you can see the Steve Kerber monitoring his equipment, mm -hmm. and uh, the doc from Skidmore and our yep. medical crew standing by. We have an ambulance crew standing by, with medics ready to go in case there's a problem. And like we said, we're, we're conducting the research in real time, so with that, we also have to keep the uh, human subjects inside the fire building operating for an extended period of time so we can glean some of those physiological metrics. And as you can see, the second victim has been removed. We will acquire the data off the sensors from that victim as well to show their survivability behind a closed bedroom door and the benefits benefits of compartmentizing the, the interior of the fire building. Two more minutes. Two more minutes, and you'll send them into research, which is consistent with every other of the, of the absolutely ones you've done yep. so far. As soon as we hit 17 minutes, and then uh, once that happens, the uh, overhaul crew will go in and they'll get 10 minutes worth of work actually about 15 minutes worth of work doing overhaul and uh, then we'll go ahead past command and have the outside vent crew the pump operator and the incident commander go and get all their testing done and uh, Gavin will take command from there we'll have the overhaul crew work and then we'll send them and then we'll terminate outstanding outstanding so typically, if it was one of our experiments, pretty much it's done at this point. Fire's knocked down, fire's done. This is actually the start of much of the experiment for the exposure and the uh, cardiovascular strain component. So now the overhaul crew will go in, and just like the other experiments, what they're doing is they're gathering data on how much toxins these folks are going to mm -hmm. you know, be exposed to. And the first arriving engine has just exited the fire building. So immediately once they're done, they go right to research because, again, we doffed the gear, we started accumulating the, the, uh, the skin wipes, etc., and we're seeing just a tremendous amount of accumulation, especially under the hood. Uh, you'll be amazed at how many particulates are, are seeping through that hood. So what you see here is as soon as she pulls that mask, she's taking that tube, she's exhaling, and we're capturing that very first breath. So this is a really critical part. This has never been done before. Dr. Smith, there's your, there's your MSA. Look at that beautiful pot. That's a gorgeous. Wear your MSA. Don't be smoke. So there's her, her, her person capturing her equipment. She's going to take her over now. You'll see the firefighter. She's heading over to go get her swab down. Matt, how are you feeling? Great. Go ahead, Dr. So, Matt, uh, you, you're on an awesome. What uh, you know, would you see and what would you feel on the interior? We had a... Uh, Bedrooms that we're going, it's coming down the hallway. We Pretty want typical to for uh, so push regular room and contents, design. normal little furniture as far as uh, bed, some dressers, some TVs, things like that. Carpet was going. So uh, zero viz, good high heat, uh, decent knockdown pretty much as soon as we got to it. So I got to get a blood pressure here real quick. Okay. And again, we, we constantly monitor blood pressure here, and unfortunately, we have to remain perfectly still to you know, validate the actual pressure in the research of, of him actually at rest. So, unfortunately, you have to become a statue when that thing starts to pump. It, it pumps up, I believe, every five minutes for a total of three more after we're done here. What happened to Matt here during this? So, again, as you can see, if, if you don't mind, Matt, just showing us your hands for a moment. Um, as you can see, he's had some some of the bullets and the, the, uh, the soot, if you will, wiped off his hands again. He. He kind of bathes his hands in corn oil to help absorb those particulates. We wipe that down, and then we put, you can see there's some black tubes off here uh, as well. Those are actual the, the actual uh, wipes from his hands, and again, that goes to the lab and uh, is analyzed immediately. So right now he's going to be getting his second blood draw. Uh, what we have here is a square foot of a typical apparatus cab. As you can see, there is gear inside that tongue. Also, we have chemical sensors that are hung at, at the top there so we can actually get the, the measurements from the off-gassing of this gear. As you can see, this gear is heavily contaminated, uh, just as contaminated as it would be if we were to actually exit a fire building and put ourselves back in service uh, and return to the firehouse. So very key component that, that everybody can agree with uh, on this study. So, The next step that will happen is we'll want to take that gear out and decon it. 
In order to do that, we're going to have some of the NIOSH researchers. I, I hope you get a chance to see this. I, I'm not sure about timing. But they're going to dress up in Tyvek suits and then put that dirty gear on. Then they'll walk outside the bay and do the decon method for today, which is the rinse and brush. Then it goes back into this chamber so that you can measure the off-gassing to see if that was effective. The off-gassing is one piece, also the swabs to see if it's particulate Now, will we, will we check our NIOSH folks after they put the gear on? And That would be interesting, too. That would be interesting, too. But one thing I will say, they have enough of a sense of the risk that they're being exposed to that they're in full people. So they will be wearing Tyvek suits and they will be wearing gloves because they know what's on this stuff. Yeah, very interesting. Can you interesting one more quick yeah, point? No, you, Doc, this, it's your show. You know, this looks a little bit like a, a walk-in closet. You know, a nicer walk-in closet than I have, but it's been designed specifically to replicate the volume of an apparatus so that we can get some sense of exposure to the guys coming back. We have Dr. Fred coming by who's running this part of the project. I'd love you to grab him and see what's going to happen with and, it's, and, and the guys and the guys and gals that are in the fire service, you need to understand that this stuff is anecdotal. This is all highly controlled. We we're just talking about your people who are going to put on Tyvek suits, put this gear back on, right. and then and do gross decon, right. and and measure that. So, what are some of the concerns that you have as a crew leader about doing that? About doing the decon? Yeah. I mean, we, we want to. I guess the main purpose is to try to do decon that could actually be implemented by firefighters in the field. Um, so we're, we're trying to do it um, thoroughly, but using simple methods. So the three that we're looking at are um, a dry brush method, uh, wet decon with uh, a Dawn detergent, and then an air-based method that we're developing. But your people, your people are doing it in Tyvek suits. Right. Well, My people are going to be in t-shirts. So the idea is to do decon right after firefighting. Right. So ho hopefully, in the ideal situation, they can still be on air. But might we but discover, through what you're doing here, that it's better to just bag it and wash it and, and not deal with it? it possibly. Because that's yeah. what, there are crews in Florida now that are doing right. it that way. They're just, they're just doffing their gear, station wear, to putting that gear in bags, right. and off it goes. Uh, gets cleaned up and they wear they wear a second set of gear. We've also learned that one department, the battalion chief, is actually doing a hood exchange on the fire ground with members. So that is uh, looking to become a, a that, best practice pretty soon. Here, interesting. That's something else that we're looking at. Um, for we've got 12 sets of gear, six sets of the uh, hoods we're laundering each time, um, and we're going to see if that has any effect on the biological levels that we're measuring. So something else that we're so, you know. so as a as an organization, the NIOSH has been doing line of duty death reports for us for about thirty years. Right. And now with this added knowledge that's coming into it, how do you see that uh, evolving in terms of what we do when we have an injury or a line of duty death? I mean, changing any procedures, looking for, I mean, just from anecdote. I mean, just futuring, because I think that's important that we do that because it's gonna it's gonna shape how you do future experiments. And I think that's important stuff because you know, we never really understood the depth of what was going on with particulate matter getting into the cardiovascular systems. Right. We never understood core temperatures going up. We always thought it was thermal insult, pure and simple. But now we're finding out it's a much deeper problem. Right. Yeah, I mean, depending on what we learn from the data, it could have, um, you know, it could make some changes on those line of duty deaths. Maybe we start looking at uh, what their previous chemical exposures were. Yeah. Right, and, and you know, and a lot of folks railed when we went to the 24-hour period after a fire. But I think now what we're seeing is that the presumptions that we had, that the cardiotoxic elements and the core temperatures being increased are so detrimental that those effects probably could be directly related now much more concretely based on some of this evidence to those, to those line of duty deaths that some people were saying, well, it's 24 hours later. What could that have done with, you know, weren't they rested by then or weren't they? But this is insidious stuff. This is really, this is really fascinating stuff I mean, right. to me. And, and I also think that we'll have, you know, good data for, for those that are seeking the cancer presumptive laws in, in several states. Obviously now with this, this data and this accumulation methods, we can actually look at our long-term risk exposure, which can, again, aid those, uh, yeah. those, and, and, those, uh, 
You hate to say it, but I... You fire departments are looking for that presumptive legislation. Maybe seeing firefighters slipping on Tyvex before they put on bunker gloves. I'm just thinking out loud from what, what we're doing. We're putting on Tyvex before we put it on to decon here to protect his people. But my people are wearing cotton t-shirts and, and BVD. So I, I'm just saying. But I'm a jihadist <laughs> for safety. So, yeah, no, I, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. There's, there's not a safety leaf I won't turn over. And, and that's what we're going to do this afternoon. Listen, why don't you come in for a quick shot here? We're, we're probably getting close to having to sign off, so I really wanted to have a chance before we do the roundtable. Join us at 5.30 Eastern, 4.30 Central, 2.30 uh, Pacific for uh, uh, an unplugged session. With Dr. Smith, Dr. Horn, uh, I'm sorry, Fence. Kenny Fence, Kenny Fence from NIOSH, uh, Doug from NIOSH. We're going to bring in some some of his people, all of the participants, as many of the researchers, people from uh, uh, Illinois Fire Services Institute. Uh, we're going to hopefully maybe get somebody from Globe to come down, somebody from NSA, and we're going to have a real discussion about what does all this mean? Not what does it mean? Where's it going? What should we be thinking about? We're at the beginning of, we're just at the beginning of the beginning. And it's a chance for you to have some input, for you to get involved, and for you to be a part of the history of the fire service. Because this is, this is a sentinel moment. This is a groundbreaking event. And if you don't participate, shame on you. We all have something to offer. So I don't care if you're a firefighter out there with six months on, six days, six hours. Go to FE Talk and ask your questions. And if you're an old salt with 30 or 40 years, and, and, and you've had concerns about things all along, now's the time to voice them. Now's the time to share. And we can't NIOSH enough. We can't the, the folks from Skidmore College and Dr. Smith and her crew, the good folks from the Illinois Fire Institute, the beautiful people from Globe, and our great friends from MSA who have been providing world-class products in the fire service for over 100 years. During the break, please go to msa.com. Look at their incredible equipment. MSA, one of the best manufacturers, out there for the American Fire Service. Don't breathe smoke. Get your MSA. I'm Bobby Halton. I think we're just about wrapping up. Thank you for tuning us. We'll see you at 5.30 Eastern, 2 o'clock Pacific, 4.30 Central. Tune in then. We're out of here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.